Chapter Twenty Five of the Lamplighter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. The Lamplighter by Maria Susanna Cummins. Chapter Twenty Five. Some say that gleams of a remoter world visit the soul in sleep. Shelley. It was a fortunate thing for Gertrude that Thanksgiving week was approaching, as that was a vacation time at Mr. W.'s school, and she would thus be more at leisure to attend to her multiplied cares. She considered herself favored, too, in obtaining the services of Jane, who willingly consented to come and help Miss Gertrude. She did not, she said, exactly like the idea of living out, but couldn't refuse a young lady who had been so good to them in times past. Gertrude had feared that, with Nan Grant sick in the house, Mrs. Miller would not be able to give up her eldest daughter. But Mary, a second girl, having returned home unexpectedly, one of them could be very conveniently spared. Under Gertrude's tuition, Jane, who was neat and capable, was able, after a few days, to relieve Mrs. Sullivan of nearly all her household duties, and so far provide for many of her personal wants, as to leave Gertrude at liberty to pay frequent visits to the sick room of Nan, whose fever, having reached its height, rendered her claim for aid at present the most imperative. We need hardly say that, in Gertrude's still vivid recollections of her former sufferings under the rule of Nan, there remained nothing of the bitterness or a spirit of revenge. If she remembered the past, it was only to pity and forgive her persecutor. If she meditated upon the course she should herself pursue towards her once hated tyrant, it was only to revolve in her mind how she could best serve and comfort her. Therefore, night after night found her watching by the bedside of the sick woman who, though still delirious, had entirely lost the fear and dread she had at first seemed to feel at her presence. Nan talked much of little Gertie, sometimes in a way that led Gertrude to believe herself recognized, but more frequently as if the child were supposed to be absent, and it was not until a long time after that Gertrude was led to adopt the correct supposition, which was that she had been mistaken for her mother, whom she much resembled, and whom, though tended in her last sickness by Nan herself, the fevered, diseased, and conscience-stricken sufferer believed had come back to claim her child at her hands. It was only the continued assurances of goodwill on Gertrude's part, and her unwearied efforts to soothe and comfort her, that finally led Nan to the belief that the injured mother had found her child in health and safety, and was ignorant of the wrongs and unkindness she had endured. One night, it was the last of Nan's life, Gertrude, who had scarcely left her during the previous day, and was still maintaining her watch, heard her own name mingled with those of others in a few rapid sentences. She approached the bed and listened intently, for she was always in hopes, during these partly incoherent ravings, to gain some information concerning her own early life. Her name was not repeated, however, and for some time the muttering of Nan's voice was indistinct. Then suddenly starting up and addressing herself to some imaginary person, she shouted aloud, "'Stevie, Stevie, give me back the watch, and tell me what you did with the rings. They will ask those folks, and what shall I tell them?' Then after a pause, during which her eyes were fixed steadily upon the wall, she said, in a more feeble, but equally earnest voice, "'No, no, Stevie, I never'll tell. I never, never will.' The moment the words had left her lips, she started turned, saw Gertrude standing by the bedside, and with a frightened look, shrieked rather than asked, "'Did you hear? Did you hear?' "'You did,' continued she, "'and you'll tell. Oh, if you do!' She was here preparing to spring from the bed, but overcome with exhaustion, sunk back on the pillow. Summoning both Mr. and Mrs. Miller, who, half expecting to be called up during the night, had lain down in the next room, the agitated Gertrude, believing that her own presence was too exciting, left the now dying woman to their care, and sought in another part of the house to calm her disturbed mind and disordered nerves. Learning about an hour afterwards from Mrs. Miller that Nan had become comparatively calm, but was utterly prostrated in strength, and seemed near her end, Gertrude thought it best not to enter the room again, and sitting down by the kitchen stove, pondered in her mind the strange scene she had witnessed. Day was just dawning when Mrs. Miller came to tell her that Nan had breathed her last. Gertie's work of mercy, forgiveness, and Christian love, being thus finished, she hastened home to recruit her wasted strength, and fortify herself, as she best might, for the labor and suffering yet in store for her. 
and it was no ordinary strength and fortitude that she needed to sustain her through a period, such as persons in this world are often called upon to meet, when scenes of suffering, sickness, and death follow each other in such quick succession, that ere one shock can be recovered from, and composure of mind restored, another blow comes to add its force to the already overwhelming torrent. In less than three weeks from the time of Nan Grant's death, Paul Cooper was smitten by the destroyer's hand, and after a brief illness, he too was laid to his last rest. And though the deepest feelings of Gertrude's heart were not in either case fully awakened, it was no slight call upon the mental and physical endurance of a girl of eighteen to bear up under the self-imposed duties occasioned by each event. And that, too, at a time when her mind was racked by the apprehension of a new and far more intense grief. Emily's absence was also a sore trial to her, for she was accustomed to rely upon her for advice and counsel, and in seasons of peculiar distress to learn patience and submission from one who was herself a living exemplification of both virtues. Only one letter had been received from the travellers, and that, written by Mrs. Ellis, contained little that was satisfactory. It was written from Havana, where they were boarding in a house kept by an American lady, and crowded with visitors from Boston, New York, and other northern cities. "'It ain't so very pleasant after all, Gertrude,' wrote Mrs. Ellis, "'and I only wish we were safe home again, and not on my own account either, so much as Emily's. She feels kind of strange here.' and no wonder, for it's a dreadful uncomfortable sort of a place. The windows have no glass about them, but are grated just like a prison, and there is not a carpet in the house, nor a fireplace, though sometimes the mornings are quite cold. There's a widder here, with a brother and some nieces. The widder is a flaunting kind of a woman, that I begin to think, if you'll believe it, is either setting her cap for Mr. Graham, or means to make an old fool of him. She is one of your loud-talking women, that dress up a good deal, and like to take the lead. And Mr. Graham is just silly enough to follow after her party, and go to all sorts of rides and excursions. It's so ridiculous, and he over sixty-five years old. Emily and I have pretty much done going into the parlor, for these gay folks don't take any sort of notice of us. Emily doesn't say a word, or complain a bit, but I know she is not happy here, and would be glad to be back in Boston." and so should I, if it wasn't for that horrid steamboat. I liked to have died with seasickness, Gertrude, coming out, and I dread going home so, that I don't know what to do. Gertrude wrote frequently to Emily, but as Miss Graham was dependent upon Mrs. Ellis's eyesight, and the letters must, therefore, be subject to her scrutiny, she could not express her innermost thoughts and feelings, as she was wont to do in conversation with her sympathizing and indulgent friend. Every India mail brought news from William Sullivan, who prosperous in business, and rendered happy, even in his exile, by the belief that the friends he loved best were in the enjoyment of the fruits of his exertions, wrote always in his accustomed strain of cheerfulness. One Sabbath afternoon, a few weeks after Mr. Cooper's death, found Gertrude with an open letter in her hand, the numerous postcards upon the outside of which proclaimed from whence it came. It had that day been received, and Mrs. Sullivan, as she lay stretched upon her couch, had been listening for the third time to the reading of its contents. The bright hopes expressed by her son, and the gay tone in which he wrote, all unconscious, as he yet was, of the cloud of sorrow that was gathering for him, formed so striking a contrast to her own reflections, that she lay with her eyes closed, and oppressed with an unwanted degree of sadness, while Gertrude, as she glanced at the passage, in which Willie dilated upon the joy of once more clasping in his arms the dear little mother whom he so longed to see again, and then turned her gaze upon the wasted and faded cheek of that mother, felt an indescribable chill at her heart. Dr. Jeremy's first fears were all confirmed, and her disease still further aggravated by the anxiety and agitation which attended her father's sickness and death. Mrs. Sullivan was rapidly passing away. Whether she were herself aware that this was the case, Gertrude had not yet been able to determine. She had never spoken upon the subject, or intimated in any manner a conviction of her approaching end. And Gertrude, as she surveyed her placid countenance, was almost inclined to believe that she was yet deceiving herself with the expectation of recovery. All doubt on this point was soon removed, for after remaining a short time engaged in deep thought, or perhaps in prayer, Mrs. Sullivan opened her eyes, 
fixed them upon her young attendant, and said, in a calm, distinct voice, "'Gertrude, I shall never see Willie again.' Gertrude made no reply. "'I wish to write him, and tell him so myself,' she continued. "'Or, rather, if you will write for me, as you have done so many times already, I should like to tell you what to say, and I feel that no time is to be lost, for I am failing fast, and may not long have strength enough left to do it. It will devolve upon you, my child, to let him know when all is over. But you have had too many sad duties already, and it will spare you somewhat to have me prepare him to hear bad news. Will you commence a letter to-day? Certainly, Auntie, if you think it best. I do, Gertie. What you wrote by the last mail was chiefly concerning Grandpa's sickness and death, and there was nothing mentioned which would be likely to alarm him on my account, was there? Nothing at all. Then it is quite time he should be forewarned. Poor boy! I do not need Dr. Jeremy to tell me that I am dying. Did he tell you so? asked Gertrude, as she went to her desk and began to arrange her writing materials. No, Gertie, he was too prudent for that, but I told him, and he did not contradict me. You have known it some time, have you not? inquired she, gazing earnestly in the face of Gertrude, who had returned to the couch, and seated upon the edge of it, was bending over the invalid, and smoothing the hair from her forehead. Some weeks, replied Gertrude, as she spoke, imprinting a kiss upon the pale brow of the sufferer. Why did you not tell me? Why should I, dear auntie, said Gertrude, her voice trembling with emotion. I knew the Lord could never call you at a time when your lamp would not be trimmed and burning. Feebly, it burns feebly, said the humble Christian. Whose then is bright? responded Gertrude, if yours be dim. Have you not for years past been a living lesson of piety and patience? Unless it be Emily, auntie, I know of no one who seems so fit for heaven. Oh, no, Gertie, I am a sinful creature, full of weakness. Much as I long to meet my Saviour, my earthly heart pines with the vain desire for one more sight of my boy, and all my dreams of heaven are mingled with the aching regret that the one blessing I most craved on earth has been denied me. Oh, auntie, exclaimed Gertrude, we are all human. Until the mortal puts on immortality, how can you cease to think of Willie, and long for his presence in this trying hour? It cannot be a sin, that which is so natural. I do not know, Gertie. Perhaps it is not. And if it be, I trust, before I go hence, I shall be blessed with a spirit of perfect submission, that will atone for the occasional murmuring of a mother's heart. Read to me, my dear, some holy words of comfort. You always seem to open the good book at the passage I most need. It is sinful, indeed, in me, Gertrude, to indulge the least repining, blessed as I am, in the love and care of one who is dear to me as a daughter. Gertrude took her Bible, and opening it at the Gospel of St. Mark, her eye fell at once upon the account of our Saviour's agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. She rightly believed that nothing could be more appropriate to Mrs. Sullivan's state of mind than the touching description of the struggle of our Lord's humanity, nothing more likely to soothe her spirit, and reconcile her to the occasional rebellion of her own mortal nature, than the evident contest of the human with the divine so thrillingly narrated by the disciple, and that nothing could be more inspiring than the example of that holy Son of God, who ever to his thrice-repeated prayer, that, if possible, the cup might pass from him, added the pious ejaculation, Thy will, not mine, be done. Without hesitation, therefore, she read what first met her glance, and had the satisfaction of seeing that the words were not without effect. For when she had finished, she observed that as Mrs. Sullivan lay still and calm upon her couch, her lips seemed to be repeating the Saviour's prayer, not wishing to disturb her meditations, Gertrude made no reference to the proposed letter to Willie, but sat in perfect silence, and about half an hour afterwards Mrs. Sullivan fell asleep. It was a gentle, quiet slumber, and Gertrude sat and watched with pleasure the peaceful, happy expression of her features. Darkness had come on before she awoke, and so shrouded the room that Gertrude, who still sat there, was invisible in the gloom. She started on hearing her name, and hastily lighting a candle, approached the couch. "'Oh, Gertrude,' said Mrs. Sullivan, "'I have had such a beautiful dream. Sit down by me, my dear, and let me tell it to you. It could not have been more vivid if it had all been reality. I thought I was sailing rapidly through the air, and for some time I seemed to float on and on, 
over clouds and among bright stars. The motion was so gentle that I did not grow weary, though in my journey I traveled over land and sea. At last I saw beneath me a beautiful city, with churches, towers, monuments, and throngs of gay people moving in every direction. As I drew nearer, I could distinguish the faces of these numerous men and women, and among them, in a crowded street, there was one who looked like Willie. I followed him, and soon felt sure it was he. He looked older than when we saw him last, and much as I have always imagined him, since the descriptions he has given in his letters of the change that has taken place in his appearance. I followed him through several streets, and at last he turned into a fine, large building, which stood near the center of the city. I went in also. We passed through large halls and beautifully furnished rooms, and at last stood in a dining salon, in the middle of which was a table covered with bottles, glasses, and the remains of a rich dessert, such as I never saw before. There was a group of young men round the table, all well dressed, and some of them fine looking, so that at first I was quite charmed with their appearance. I seemed, however, to have a strange power of looking into their hearts and detecting all the evil that was there. One had a very bright, intelligent face and might have been thought a man of talent. And so he was, but I could see better than people usually can, and I perceived, by a sort of instinct, that all his mind and genius were converted into a means of duping and deceiving those who were so foolish or so ignorant as to be ensnared. And in a corner of his pocket I knew he had a pair of loaded dice. Another seemed, by his wit and drollery, to be the charm of the company, but I could detect marks of intoxication, and felt a certainty that in less than an hour he would cease to be the master of his own actions. A third was making a vain attempt to look happy, but his very soul was bared to my searching gaze, and I was aware of the fact that he had the day before lost at the gaming-table all his own and a part of his employer's money, and was tortured with anxiety lest he might not this evening be fortunate enough to win it back. There were many others present, and all, more or less sunk in dissipation, had reached various stages on the road to ruin. Their faces, however, looked animated and gay, and as Willie glanced from one to another, he seemed pleased and attracted. One of them offered him a seat at the table, and all urged him to take it. He did so, and the young man at his right filled a glass with bright wine, and handed it to him. He hesitated, then took it, and raised it to his lips. Just then I touched him on the shoulder. He turned, saw me, and instantly the glass fell from his hand, and was broken into a thousand pieces. I beckoned, and he immediately rose and followed me. The gay circle he had left called loudly upon him to return. One of them even laid a hand upon his arm, and tried to detain him. But he would not listen or stay. He shook off the hand that would have held him, and we went on. Before we had got outside the building, the man whom I had first noticed, and whom I knew to be the most artful of the company, came out from a room near the door, which he had reached by some other direction, and approaching Willie, whispered in his ear. Willie faltered, turned, and would perhaps have gone back. But I placed myself in front of him, held up my finger menacingly, and shook my head. He hesitated no longer, but flinging aside the tempter, rushed out of the door, and was down the long flight of steps before I could overtake him. I seemed, however, to move with great rapidity, and soon found myself taking the lead, and guiding my son through the intricate, crowded streets of the city. Many were the adventures we encountered, many the snares we found laid for the unwary in every direction. More than once my watchful eye saved the thoughtless boy by my side from some pitfall or danger, into which, without me, he would have surely fallen. Occasionally I lost sight of him, and was obliged to turn back. Now he had been separated from me by the crowd, and consequently missed his way, and now he had purposely lingered to witness or join in the amusements of the gay populace. Each time, however, he listened to my warning voice, and we went on in safety. At last, however, and passing through a brilliantly lighted street, for it was now evening, I suddenly observed that he was absent from my side. I went backwards and forwards, but he was nowhere to be seen. For an hour I hunted the streets, and called him by name, but there was no answer. I then unfolded my wings, and soaring high above the crowded town, surveyed the whole, hoping that in one glance I might, as I had at first done, detect my boy. I was not disappointed, 
in a gorgeous hall dazzlingly lit and filled with gaiety and fashion i beheld willie a brilliant young creature was leaning on his arm and i saw into her heart and knew that she was not blind to his beauty or insensible to his attractions but oh i trembled for him now she was lovely and rich and it was evident to me from the elegance of her dress and the attention she attracted that she was also fashionable and admired i saw into her soul however and she was vain proud cold-hearted and worldly and if she loved willie it was his beauty his winning manners and his smile that pleased her not his noble nature which she knew not how to prize as they promenaded through the hall and she whom crowds were praising gave all her time and thoughts to him i descending in an invisible shape and standing by his side touched his shoulder as i had done before he looked around but before he could see his mother's face the siren's voice attracted all his attention again and again i endeavored to win him away but he heard me not at length she spoke some word that betrayed to my high-minded boy the folly and selfishness of her worldly soul i seized the moment when she had thus weakened her hold upon him and clasping him in my arms spread my wings and soared far far away bearing with me the prize i had toiled after in one as we rose into the air my manly son became in my encircling arms a child again and there rested on my bosom the same little head with its soft silken curls that had nestled there in infancy back we flew over sea and land and paused not until on a soft grassy slope under the shade of green trees i thought i saw my darling gertie and was flying to lay my precious boy at her feet when i awoke pronouncing your name and now gertrude the bitterness of the cup i am called upon to drink is passed away a blessed angel has indeed ministered unto me i no longer wish to see my son again on this earth for i am persuaded that my departure is in perfect accordance with the schemes of a merciful providence i now believe that willie's living mother might be powerless to turn him from temptation and evil but the spirit of that mother will be mighty still and in the thought that she in her home beyond the skies is ever watching around his path and striving to lead him in the straight and narrow way he may find a truer shield from danger a firmer rest to his tempted soul than she could have been while yet on earth now o oh my father i can say from the depths of my heart thy will not mine be done from this time until her death which took place about a month afterward mrs sullivan's mind remained in a state of perfect resignation and tranquillity as she said the last pang had lost its bitterness in the letter which she dictated to willie she expressed her perfect trust in the goodness and wisdom of providence and exhorted him to cherish the same submissive love for the all-wise she reminded him of the early lessons she had taught him the piety and self-command which she had inculcated, and made it her dying prayer that her influence might be increased rather than diminished and her presence felt to be a continual reality she gave the important caution to one who had faithfully struggled with adversity to beware of the dangers and snares which attend prosperity and besought him never to discredit or disgrace his childhood's training after gertrude had folded the letter which she supposed completed and left the house to attend to those duties in school which she still continued regularly to perform mrs sullivan reopened the nearly covered sheet and with her own feeble and trembling hand recounted the disinterested patient loving devotion of gertrude so long said she my son as you cherish in your heart the memory of your grandfather and mother cease not to bestow all the gratitude of which that heart is capable upon one whose praises my hand is too feeble to portray so slow and gradual was the decline of mrs sullivan that her death at last came as an unexpected blow to gertrude who though she saw the ravages of disease could not realize that a termination must come to their work in the dead hours of the night with no one to sustain and encourage her but the frightened and trembling jane did she watch the departing spirit of her much-loved friend are you afraid to see me die gertrude asked mrs sullivan about an hour before her death on gertrude's answering that she was not then turn me a little towards you said she that your face my darling may be the last to me of earth it was done and with her hand locked fast in gertrude's and a look that spoke of the deepest affection she expired. End of chapter 25